We are now ready to address one of the three geographically oriented panel topics today. The title of this panel, Why is Partnership with Russia So Elusive, gets to the core of a number of issues raised this morning. To moderate this distinguished panel, we are very fortunate to have a man of impeccable character and great intellect, former Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Policy. As a member of the Board of Directors of the Institute of Peace, he's personally helped to chair our Future of Europe and Russia working groups. And he's soon to be the nation's Deputy National Security Advisor. Please join me in welcoming Steve Hadley. I have a very easy task this morning, which is to introduce our distinguished panelists. It's easy because it's going to be very short, and it's going to be short because time is very brief and we don't want to use it up with introductions. And secondly, these people are all very well known to you. Um, we're privileged to have with us today to talk about this subject, Strobe Talbot, who is the uh, Deputy Secretary of State, uh, Sergei Rogoff, who is Director of the Institute of the USA and Canada, and Paula Dobriansky, who is Vice President and Director of the Washington Office of the Council on Foreign Relations. And without further ado, um, the speakers will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes, uh, and then we will have some time at the end for questions. Um, Strobe, why don't you lead off for us? Thanks, Steve. And first of all, congratulations to you on your new assignment. Good luck to you. Uh, somebody who's known and admired you and occasionally had the chance to work with you over the years, uh, your appointment uh, gives me uh, great confidence uh, in many respects, including uh, with respect to the Bush administration's conduct of policy towards the Russian Federation and the other former Soviet uh, republics. I think both, both to economize on time and also because this group uh, insofar as I can uh, see who's here, I'm semi-blinded by the light in front of us, but I've already seen enough of the cast of characters to know that this is an extraordinarily uh, sophisticated, knowledgeable group, group, and I can be almost uh, telegraphic in making a few points uh, at the outset. Uh, and then when uh, Paul and Sergei have finished, we can uh, elaborate on whatever is of interest uh, to uh, all of you here. I think that uh, perhaps the best way to, for me to frame a few observations would be to uh, comment on the presidential transition, by which I mean the one from Boris Yeltsin to Vladimir Putin. <laughs> uh, if in due course uh, there's some interest uh, in any other presidential transitions, uh, we can uh, certainly talk about that. But in all seriousness, I think in a very real sense, there is uh, less certainty uh, and indeed uh, less uh, surety about continuity on the Russian side uh, than on the American side. Uh, I would uh, summarize the Yeltsin presidency by pointing out several uh, positives uh, which were genuine accomplishments, it remains to be seen whether they will be legacies. The difference between an accomplishment and a legacy is that an accomplishment is a good thing, a legacy lasts. So query whether the things that I'm about to mention are in fact uh, uh, irreversible and going to be permanently part of the Russian Federation that the Bush administration and indeed its successors deal with in the years to come. The positives are basically five. First of all, the dismantlement of the command uh, economy. Uh, parenthesis, uh, at a huge cost uh, in terms of uh, systemic uh, deformations in the economy, corruption, loans for shares, a lot of other things uh, that we will uh, no doubt want to talk about if time uh, permits. But I think nonetheless, the fact that the old Soviet economic system was dismantled was uh, extremely important, including with regard to the second point uh, that I would uh, attribute largely to uh, the Yeltsin presidency, and that is Boris Yeltsin detested and therefore went a long way to uh, demolishing or defanging 
of the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, which was a direct and uh, unapologetic uh, successor to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Uh, the third positive is that uh, under his presidency, uh, what I will call electoralism, uh, I use that term even though it's a little jargonedly, advisedly, uh, as opposed to democracy, which is a somewhat more complicated subject, but the habit of the Russian people going to the polls regularly and voting for their leaders at a local, uh, municipal level, at a regional level, and at a national level uh, set down fairly uh, deep roots. Elections became very much the test of political legitimacy, and particularly given where Russia was coming from, that is a big deal. Fourth point is the uh, relative uh, flourishing of free media uh, in Russia during that period, and, and also other institutions of civil society, including non-governmental organizations. Uh, and I'd like, uh, at least in the discussion, to come back to that as an accomplishment which may or may not be a legacy depending on whether the Putin administration is willing to sustain and develop the trend in that direction about which I think we all have some questions. Fifth point has to do with uh, what the Russians call the CIS, uh, but what uh, we, the Clinton administration, have called the NIS, uh, putting the emphasis on the fact that there are new independent states rather than on the necessary permanence of the <coughs> institutional umbrella, the Commonwealth of Independent States that uh, was set up over the last 10 years. I think uh, President Yeltsin's uh, essential posture towards the CIS was one of what I would call benign or constructive passivity and even a principle. Now this really goes back to 91 when uh, all of these now new independent states were part of the Soviet Union and President Yeltsin wanted to uh, use the issue of respect for the right of each republic of the Soviet Union to be an independent state as a part of the predicate for the secession and independence and sovereignty of the Russian, Russian Federation. But nonetheless, it tended to be a hallmark uh, of his own presidency. And it was apparent uh, in the way he stood up to irredentists uh, in the Duma over such issue as issues as the Crimea. Uh, it was, I think, uh, crucial when it came to the denuclearization of Ukraine as well as Belarus and, and, and Kazakhstan, uh, because as you all recall, the denuclearization agreement involved Russian uh, acknowledgement and guarantees of Ukrainian sovereignty. Uh, there was, of course, an exception during that period, a very relevant one, because it continues to be problematic to this day, and that is Georgia. But uh, I would say that Georgia was more the exception uh, that proves the rule. Now, the um, Yeltsin presidency also uh, created some problems, exacerbated some problems, and left some problems uh, unanswered. And among those are uh, the fundamental uh, dynamic or the uh, relationship between economics and politics. Uh, it's, uh, a problem that I once uh, was stupid enough to put into a tagline tag or a wisecrack, which is the, the necessity of accompanying shock with therapy. Uh, but the point uh, is, I think, a valid one, particularly in a democratic state. There must be uh, a, a critical mass of popular support for economic policies, uh, otherwise you get the wrong kind of explosion. You get a critical mass of opposition to the economic policies uh, imposed from on high, and that brings you blowbacks and backlashes of the kind that we saw in the December 93 election in the Zhirinovsky victory and in the 95 December election in the Zuganov communist uh, victory. And that is basically the, the sort of shock therapy uh, interaction uh, has not been uh, worked out in Russia. And I might add, we, the United States, we, the West, uh, have not come up with a perfect uh, set of remedies or advice on how the Russians uh, should get that right. Second is the question of the oligarchs, uh, which I think goes to another issue, and that is the failure, the inability, uh, particularly after the 96 
presidential election in Russia to institutionalize reform. Uh, and we have uh, uh, seen that bill come due in the kind of uh, let, a, let a hundred oligarchs bloom approach of the previous uh, presidency in Russia, which is uh, the President Putin's uh, administration is trying to deal with uh, different and in some ways I think quite problematic ways. Third is the role of the security institutions. I think that was left unaddressed and undefined. Uh, under Yeltsin, and uh, that has uh, created, I think, uh, part of the basis uh, for the, uh, the quite remarkable uh, assertion of institutional control that those organizations now have, including in the area of Russian foreign policy. And then fourth and last, I would mention Chechnya. Chechnya is, of course, uh, a, uh, a running uh, challenge. Uh, not only to the most basic international norms and values of human rights and the way government should behave towards their citizens, but it's also a running challenge to the very viability, not to mention acceptability, of Russia as a democratic uh, multi-ethnic state that, uh, that deserves uh, integration into the international community. Uh, President Putin, in a very real sense, rode that issue into the presidency, but there were uh, two wars in Chechnya during the Yeltsin presidency, and he bears a lot of responsibility uh, for uh, for both of them. Uh, Steve, I would conclude, there are obviously lots of other things that we can and will talk about. I would conclude by identifying two issues that I would hope that uh, you and Condi and General Powell and, uh, and the rest of the team would, on behalf of President Bush, give a lot of prominence to early on in both uh, defining the issues and engaging with the Russian, go Russian government. Uh, the nickname for these two issues around uh, our office is uh, norms and neighbors. Let me explain what I mean. Norms may basically means the issue of whether Russia internally will continue to evolve, evolve, evolve towards a genuinely pluralistic uh, society or whether in some fundamental way there will be a trend back uh, in the other direction. Uh, Russia is a, objectively, uh, is a diversified country uh, in every conceivable respect. Ethnicity, language, religion, uh, political predisposition, uh, and so forth. Uh, and the, I think the cardinal question uh, about the future of Russia is whether Russia will make a virtue uh, out of that diversity uh, and translate uh, that diversity into uh, governmental and institutional and civil society respect for pluralism or whether it will move back in the direction of imposing a more homogenized concept of the state and the society from above. Uh, they've been there, they've done that. I would have hoped they would, would have learned the lesson. Not entirely clear. The second, uh, the neighbors half of the norms and neighbors uh, pairing uh, has to do with Russian policy towards the other uh, NIS. And here I think we have seen some ominous trends, particularly with regard uh, to Georgia, uh, but also with regard to uh, uh, Central Asia, uh, the Transcaucasus more generally. And uh, it matters, uh, it, it should be, uh, I would hope would be, a continuing uh, cardinal principle or pillar of American foreign policy uh, that we uh, support Russia and reform there for two reasons. First, because of the way it's evolving internally, which I've already touched on, and second, because of the way it behaves towards its, na its neighbors and the right way is live and let live and respect for their sovereignty and independence. Why don't I stop right there? Thank you, Steve. Paul? Uh, first, I'd like to thank the uh, U.S. Institute of Peace uh, for holding this timely conference and uh, Dick Solomon, uh, its president, uh, president, and in particular for holding this panel on, uh, on Russia. In my presentation, I'd like to address uh, primarily four issues in looking at the question of the institutionalization of our bilateral relationship with Russia. Uh, I'd like to consider, first of all, why the relationship with Russia is important. What are the most important priorities for dealing with Russia uh, in the next few years? 
what are the promising areas of cooperation, and then what are the areas uh, which will be uh, 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 essentially a source of friction, and then finally uh, the question of how to go about institutionalizing the relationship. I start with the first premise of why our relationship with Russia is so important. Uh, even though we have uh, a very knowledgeable audience uh, before us today, I don't take it for granted that it's worth stating and restating, particularly with many of the debates that have been ongoing about where Russia fits in and the overall uh, scheme of U.S. policy and uh, uh, U.S. policy architecture. There are three primary uh, reasons as to why the relationship is important. First, Russia is a major Eurasian power, and even despite uh, its current economic and political weaknesses, Russia, in certain respects, uh, continues to remain uh, not only a great power, but wields influence. Secondly, Russia is in possession of weapons of mass destruction, and clearly one of our key interests is to avoid, to deter, any kind of anarchy or conflict in a nation with thousands of nuclear warheads. And then thirdly, and fundamentally, we have a vital stake in seeing Russia become democratic, prosperous, or at least reasonably stable. What happens in Russia can have an important spillover effect on neighboring countries. Uh, clearly, that of Ukraine, that of the Caucasus, that of Central Asia, and others. Now, as to the question as, what are the most important priorities for dealing with Russia in the next few years? I would set forth three fundamental priorities that I see um, uh, as being before us. First, the need to secure Russia's cooperation <clears throat> on a range of key uh, defense policy issues, including nuclear nonproliferation and a transition towards more stable, defense-dominant strategic environment. Secondly, we need to gain Russia's cooperation on a range of foreign policy issues on which we have a commonality of interest. Uh, while preserving our ability to vigorously protect our own interests on those foreign policy matters where we differ. For example, uh, areas where I think uh, engagement should be sustained clearly, where we have a commonality of interest, include such areas as that of combating terrorism, that of also dealing with regional hotspots. Uh, in this regard, uh, the, uh, 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 the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, as well as Afghanistan, and there are some others. And then thirdly, to the extent we can, we should help promote uh, political, democratic, uh, and economic trends, positive political, democratic, and economic trends in, in Russia. But toward this end, I would underscore the need to be realistic in our approach, that change is not going to occur overnight, that it's, uh, the process is an, uh, an evolutionary one, that we shouldn't be heavy-handed uh, or uh, preachy in this process. And it's also important, I think, to uh, uh, pursue what I believe is more the course of the future, and that is moving away from a large-scale assistance and pursuing targeted small-scale assistance to medium-sized, small-sized entrepreneurs' uh, businesses. Um, as to the third area, promising areas of cooperation and those issues which uh, can cause friction. Uh, as to this third question, let me just address this. Uh, in the area of defense security issues, I think that potential progress can, in fact, be secured with Russia with the pursuit of appropriate and effective statecraft. Now, you might ask, what is appropriate and effective statecraft? Just basically and fundamentally, I think it's having a very clear and precise understanding of what our interests are, our goals and objectives, and also a clear understanding of what Moscow's uh, interests, fundamental interests are. And trying to, based on this understanding of each respective interest, to come toward a common base. In this area, particularly with the uh, issue of uh, nuclear nonproliferation, we do have common interests. But then you get into the question, for example, of enforcement and what makes mo most sense to both sides. Let me pick another area. There's, of course, the question of offensive nuclear arms control start. And then there's the very uh, issue which some deem to be most controversial, and that's the issue of ballistic missile defense. Now, on ballistic missile defense, I, I have maybe what constitutes somewhat of a different view. I think this issue does not necessarily have to be the utmost cause of friction 
I think it depends upon how the issue is actually handled. This can be either an area of potential cooperation or a major area of confrontation. In particular, I think it's necessary that we're unequivocal in demonstrating our commitment to ballistic missile defense. Uh, I think that we need to convey that we're serious. If Moscow uh, thinks that we are wavering, then this in and of itself, I think, can result in a cause of uh, friction. Uh, in other words, we need to uh, continue uh, our discourse with them and also include them and engage them in this process. The other point I'd like to mention here is that we also have other areas in which we can develop common approaches for dealings, dealing with threats posed by, for example, Islamic fundamentalists. We're concerned about this issue, they're concerned about this issue. Uh, it's an area that I think can be explored and developed. Thirdly, there are a number of areas where we can't expect, uh, I think, Russian support, but I think we can work towards decreasing maybe the level of, of hostility or confrontation and certainly temper opposition. The areas that come readily to my mind include uh, the issue of NATO enlargement and also uh, the issue of how to deal with the Balkans. A footnote on the issue of NATO enlargement, I think if we look to the first round, uh, 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 I think it could certainly be said that we proceeded with our interests in the first round, but at the same time established a mechanism for uh, engaging Russian involvement in the NATO process without a veto. Uh, and it, I think, resulted in um, certainly uh, decreasing what um, uh, could have constituted maybe uh, hostility ongoing, and it was, it was curbed because of this structure and this mechanism which was established. Another area of cooperation is certainly that of promoting, I've already suggested, political economic, positive political economic trends and the rendering of advice in that area. Finally, one area of friction that I think will continue to be a source of friction between uh, Moscow and uh, Washington, even despite the kind of statecraft that may be employed, and that's the question of and the issue of Chechnya. I think that as long as the random violence uh, ensues, uh, that this issue is going to continue to be a source of tension between us and, and them. Let me come to the last, um, and that is the question of how to institutionalize the relationship. First, the question is, should we do it? Absolutely, yes, it should be continued uh, because the relationship is, is, is so important. It's necessary, I believe, to engage the Russians at all levels and to ensure ongoing dialogue and employ a variety of venues. My own personal preference is not to uh, 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 rely uh, solely on a single uh, official uh, top structure where all issues are filtered through. My own preference would be actually to deploy a multitude, a multitude of contacts at various levels and per issues. For example, I would actually like to see us in many ways get more out of Washington and out of Moscow and look at engagement uh, on the state level to the regional levels in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the Russian Federation. I think that that kind of engagement is important. I've in the past have dealt with farmers. Uh, knowing that farmers in Iowa enjoy their direct contact with uh, uh, individual regions throughout uh, uh, Russia. I see this as the wave of the future. The continuance of parliamentary exchanges. Congressman Kurt Weldon had launched a, um, uh, uh, a series of exchanges with the Russian Duma. That kind of dialogue, I think, is quite valuable. And then other areas, law enforcement, defense, defense, non-governmental organizations to non-governmental organizations. In sum, the title of this panel is Why is Partnership with Russia So Elusive? I think really the challenge for the new administration is um, uh, recognizing that there are going to be differences that we have to contend with, being realistic about what the differences uh, in fact are, and that even though you have these differences, that that, that certainly will not uh, poison the overall relationship. Uh, if you seek to work hard in trying to find, uh, in the midst of differences, common ground. And I think in the areas I've suggested, I think it's very doable. Sergey. Thank you so much, Steve. <coughs> it's a great pleasure and honor for me to participate in this very important conference. I understand I'm the only Russian and maybe even the only non-American who is in the list of the speakers. 
And let me make it very clear, I'm, I'm not speaking for the Russian government. I'm speaking as the director of the institute, uh, which is the largest think tank in the world dedicated to the study of the United States and uh, to promotion of Russian-American relations. So these are my personal views. And I'm very glad I have this opportunity to share them because, well, it's a new century, new millennium, and who knows, maybe a new beginning in Russian-American relations. So we should analyze uh, the lessons of the 90s, why we failed, and what we can learn from that. So I was suggested to respond to a very provocative question. Who lost Russia? Uh, apparently, well, the presumption was that I'm going to blame Strobe. I will not. <laughs> Strobe, Strobe never possessed Russia. <laughs> but then I th when I think again about it, I think I know the answer. It was Yeltsin who lost Russia. And when we look at the period of the 90s, Strobe described it as a kind of a golden age of Russian democracy and market reform. Yes, there were some very important achievements, but there were very important failures. After the collapse of communism and the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the uh, Russian Federation faced simultaneously five major challenges. The most important was to establish a new identity, because we always existed as an empire, czarist communism. We never existed as a nation state. And the multi-ethnic, multi-religious society has to have an identity which makes Russia home for all Russian citizens. And the wars in Chechnya is just one reflection of the failure to establish this new identity. The second uh, task was transition to market economy. Yes, the command economy was destroyed, but what we created, is it really market economy? The third task was uh, political democracy creation, building checks and balances. I think it's, it's premature to claim that Russia today is a mature democracy. The fourth task was <coughs> to integrate Russia into the international system. And as events in Kosovo and NATO enlargement demonstrated, Russia is not treated as an equal partner. We are assigned to some kind of a second-rate status when we are informed about the decisions which are taken by the big boys who belong. So Russia does not have a veto power Luxembourg has when the forces use the euro. <laughs> Finally, the military reform. We had to reduce our defense posture, but not simply in terms of reductions. Russian defense posture should correspond not to the global ideology of the Soviet Union, but to the real security interests of the Russian Federation. <laughs> and the Yeltsin government failed to find resolution to this problem. So it's now the Putin government which faces the same task. And Putin is somebody who is not responsible for the failures of the 90s. And that gives me hope. Yes, there are problems, and there are many problems. Strobe mentioned some of them. But it is an opportunity for a new beginning. And then let's think what should be the, the most important step we should concentrate on, upon. I think the greatest problem is that neither Russia nor the United States have a strategy. 